Mr. Hanley, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Congressman Rahul. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, be here to testify. I want to speak for a moment about the transit crisis in America that's gone on for the last five years. As a consequence of the downturn in the economy we, and the fact that uh, federal funding has been flatlined essentially to our cities, with the fall in revenue coming in from tax collections in our cities and counties, we have seen a true crisis in American mobility. We have seen 90 percent of the cities in America have to raise fares and cut service, sometimes cutting service in my hometown in New York uh, that had run for 100 years in that city uh, because of this, this lack of funding available to keep the systems running. Our members, I represent about 200,000 people who work in the transit industry in the U.S. and Canada, and our members are the frontline people who transport people in communities. They are the urban tax collectors who pull into bus stops every day and have to explain to people why their service is being cut at the same time that their fares are going up. This is in a period when there has been a bipartisan agreement in Washington that we can't raise taxes on millionaires. We just can't do that because that would wreck the economy. And yet, as we watch inequality gnawing at American society, we ignore the fact that the decision to not fund transit is one that has caused taxes to be increased again and again deliberately on the poorest Americans who need transit to get around. The other thing that's important is that Congress should understand that the notion that you can't raise taxes to provide transit service is walking in the exact opposite direction of the American people. Every time a referendum is put up around this country to raise taxes, people vote for it. Seventy percent of the referenda that have been proposed over the course of, that actually voted on over the course of the last five years, where taxpayers have an opportunity to raise their taxes to support transit, they vote yes. These referenda are passing. That is a clear signal from the American people that they not only want more transit, but they're prepared to pay for it. But more significantly, the coming crisis, the one that is looming, if you think there was a problem in Fort Lee, New Jersey, because of some political shenanigans regarding traffic, wait until you see what's about to happen in America. Over the course of the next 15 years, our cities are going to grow exponentially. There has been already an increase in the population in cities. In my own city in New York, we've grown to over 8 million people again. The projection is the metropolitan area in New York will be 20, almost 21 million people in 12 years. Where will people get transit to get around? And what about the young people in America? This may come as a surprise, but young people in America not only are moving back into cities, but they are rejecting car travel. Fewer, as a percentage of the population, fewer young people today hold driver's licenses than at any time since John Kennedy was president of this country. That is a trend that we are missing if we don't start to project a plan for how we're going to get people around. So imagine all these growing urban centers with young people who have no cars, who have no licenses, who are flooding into transit systems, and that is the case in many of our larger cities. Even more shocking, the projection for Phoenix, if anybody believes this is simply, you know, old urban cities, you know, Phoenix is projected in several years to have a population as large as the current population of New York City. Eight million people will live in the Phoenix metropolitan area soon. How are those people going to get around? America cannot depend upon cars. You know, people say that Americans are in love with their cars, and I think the fact is that's not true. They just hate everything else, and it's because everything else does not serve their interest. There have been studies that have shown, matter of fact, I have in our testimony, um, we talk about the fact that Brookings Institute found tip, in a typical metropolitan area, residents can only reach 30 percent of jobs via transit within 90 minutes. Now, knowing that, understanding that, how could anyone think that it's just a love affair between the American people and their cars? It's not. We also want to say that we will work with you. We want to work with Congress to make this happen. In 2012, 56 members of Congress or the Senate campaigned with us, bipartisan, Republicans and Democrats, worked with us around the country to build rider support to voice their interest in transit. More people, by the way, board our transit systems in America in three days than all the people that Mayor Reed talked about going through the Atlanta airport. Not to say we shouldn't fix the Atlanta airport, but the magnitude of this is huge. There are 35 million boardings a day in the United States of people riding transit. There should be many more. But these are voters. These are people who need 
more attention to, the, to, to their needs as American citizens. So we are organizing those riders. We have 91 cities across the country that have now formed rider groups. You'll be hearing from them. And we'd ask you to join us in the month of May when we go out and campaign throughout our cities and throughout rural areas to try and get more attention to transit, more funding for transit, and essentially a better way of life for American people. Thank you very much. Uh, let me turn quickly to Mr. Hanley, and I certainly want to thank you uh, for all that you do and what you do for the health and safety of our transit workers, uh, which is paramount uh, on all of our agendas. But w what impact would a slash in federal transit budget have on the workers that you represent uh, and on the riders? Well, again, um, <clears throat> am I on? Okay, I'm on. Um, what we've seen over the course of the last several years, simply with no increases in federal funding, and also, by the way, a, a bias in Congress against operating aid for transit. Um, in times of urgent economic need, we believe that the Congress should step up and fund some operating aid to keep transit systems running when the economy is not only in collapse nationally, but at the local level. But we have seen uh, over the course of the last five or six years uh, more layoffs of transit workers than we had seen since World War II. Uh, Chicago, for example. Chicago, a city that depends on transit, cut 12 percent of its transit in one day uh, in 2009 because of the economic downturn. Uh, we're a better country than that. You know, we can't abandon riders in the streets. And, uh, and at a time when the economy really needed more people at work, it was kind of silly not to keep transit workers working as well. So if there are any cuts in transit, obviously those same Two groups are going to feel it the most, the people who operate the systems, the drivers and, and the mechanics and, and uh, the people who sell tokens and, and other fair media, and, uh, and also the people who ride and depend upon transit every day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Governor Phelan and several of the other panel members referred to this, but I wonder if you could ex expand on it a little bit. Uh, for, for, a couple, for some years now, Congress has been drifting away from what we'd call regular order reauthorization of five and six year bills in major sectors of our economy. We had over a couple of dozen short term aviation reauthorizations before finally uh, adopting a, a, a multi year bill. Currently in the highway area, we're on a relatively short term authorization. And we, in any event, uh, what difference does it make if, if we? just kick the can down the road and don't do our job. Uh, we still seem to have some sort of a program in place. Why is a five or six year framework important uh, for our country? What, is it, what's, what difference does it make? Would each of you be willing to address that a little bit? Significantly in our major cities, real estate development is always built around transit. And people often forget that. But uh, the value of having a long term plan is that first it enables uh, people who start to imagine better things for their cities to put them in place. And secondly, it certainly attracts investment from people who are interested in developing the real estate and moving to different parts of town. It's vital that we have a long-term plan for, and, and particularly when you think about what's going to happen to our cities over the course of the next 15 years, as the population grows throughout urban America, uh, we are going to need a transportation infrastructure in every one of our cities to make that work. And you can't have that if you do this one year at a time. You need to have a long-term plan. If we are kind of not making real progress, if we're in you know, a fight between the House and Senate, is it important to just do something for three months or to have a crisis and deal with it and funding a major six-year bill because of the benefit of, of doing that? In other words, is it better to just keep things calm and go along even if on an inadequate framework, or is it better to face up to our problems and put a major six-year bill in place? And I don't think we need to have a fight. I think we all ought to agree. This committee, no committee in Congress has ever been more bipartisan than this committee historically, and I think that's a proud history, and you should all embrace it. Um, but look at what's happening around the world. My God, the amount of money that China is investing in its transportation, not just transporting goods, but also transporting people. America cannot afford to let itself become a third world country, and these are the kinds of things that we need to do to step up and make it happen. Uh, have you thought about 
what kinds of things the Congress should do. You understand that funding has to begin, we're funding the whole country, uh, has to begin here. Uh, should we depend on uh, users, the basis for the trust fund? Should we have another framework for funding our vital transportation? Have you given any thought to that? Do you believe that taxpayers would fund uh, a new way, would fully fund a new way to do more than patch a road yes. uh, for every uh, uh, couple of years or every year? When I was in school, we had a class called citizenship. And I assume that if they teach that class today, it's called taxpayership. Because suddenly, somewhere along the line, we switched from being citizens that cared about each other and cared about our community, and we pay, became taxpayers who wanted all that money kept to ourselves. I think Congress needs to be a little more bold on this. If we're going to have a vision for America that involves a better economy, then we have to find a way to pay for it. You've just heard from a corporate titan, Caterpillar, that we need better highways, that Caterpillar needs better highways. Well, the folks that are making the money at the top ought to figure out a way to pay for this. You know, one of the proposals that's in Congress right now is, is to tax stock transactions. Right now, by the way, we can all go out and buy, let's say, a broom this afternoon and pay a tax on it, because there's a tax on the broom. But if you buy the company that made the broom, there's no tax. So that, that seems kind of silly to me. When the company is who's getting the profits from, from the roads we build, the transit we provide for people to come to work, and again, I know this might rub against the grain for some folks who have adopted the idea that we are no longer citizens but taxpayers. And what I'm saying to you is we ought to find a way to do this and remember that at the end of the day, if we're not citizens, we have no country. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a few years ago when I chaired the uh, Highways and Transit Subcommittee, we had uh, the federal highway people had two studies uh, saying that the average uh, highway, federal highway projects took uh, 13 years. One study said 13 years, one study said 15 years from conception to completion. And Mayor Reed, I, uh, when I chaired the aviation subcommittee, the Atlanta airport people, this was many years ago, they came to us and told us that uh, their newest runway, which is now many, several years old, took 14 years from conception to completion. It took only 99 construction days and they were so relieved to get all the final approvals, they did that in 33, 24 hour days. And what I'm getting at is we, we have tried in some of these bills to do what's referred to as environmental streamlining. Most of these delays have, have been on the environmental rules and regulations and red tape. I'd like to ask all the witnesses, do you see that those efforts are, uh, have done much good or are these projects still taking too long, and I noticed Mayor Reed was talking about that he can do things much faster at the local level. Mr. Hanley? We have not experienced that problem in transit. Uh, if anything, uh, transit projects have been more streamlined uh, over the course of the last 10 years than they had been prior to that. And certainly we think more attention should be paid to the environment, not less. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and our ranking member and um, for calling this meeting and, and thanks to the witnesses for your testimony. The surface transportation legislation is one of the signature pieces of legislation for this esteemed committee and I look forward to cultivating the next um, piece of legislation with my colleagues for the coming month. Uh, I have been a strong supporter of TIFIA and had noticed that Governor Fallon had mentioned Tiffany as a benefit for her state and mentioned also the possibility of any other types of creative financing options. And I'd like to ask each one of you to tell me why you, whether or not you support Tiffany or any other creative financing that we might consider. We are i um, interested in, in all kinds of creative ways to finance these systems, but one word of caution that, that I want you to hear, and that is that the public-private partnership uh, craze that has occurred has resulted in a real attack on American workers. And again, 
It's fashionable to attack American workers, but then let's all talk about we should have equality. I mean, you can't have both. You can't attack American workers and then gripe about inequality, because that's what created it. And what's happened in the public-private partnership area in transit is that uh, companies, global companies, uh, based in England and France, uh, one, this is a really great story. The, the Veolia is, is a French transit company, a water company also. It's owned by the French social security system. And Veolia comes here and takes over transit systems, and in every single case, they eliminate the American workers' pension. Every single case. It is their corporate policy that American workers cannot have a pension if they work for Veolia. And yet it's owned by the French social security system. There's something wrong about that. And there's something wrong about us supporting public-private partnerships that result in degrading American jobs, particularly if we are then going to get up together and say, you know, we've got to wring our hands about this inequality in America. We're creating it. First of all, I'm an operating engineer, 35 years. Right? I've spent a lifetime in Good morning, brother. CAD equipment. <laughs> uh, I'm going to ask you something. Um, you know, I agree with you. States are having, uh, they're having good outcomes in asking for additional money for transit. Um, you are absolutely right. The age of between 18 and 34, people are driving increasingly less. We see for the first time in the last 10 years, numbers, miles per person in that age group are declining. Uh, we know that um, that's why the Highway Trust Fund is in trouble, the diesel tax and the excise tax and the gasoline tax, which I guess on gas you, uh, transit gets about 2.8%. I also know that um, people who use mass transit are not all poor. I've been in New York City, I'm a New Yorker. Um, you know, a lot of wealthy people that ride the transit. It's a great way to get around and increasingly, as you said, 35 million people a year, a day, lo load themselves and, and uh, your union does a great job of, of getting people where they want to go safely. Why isn't that, why doesn't that lead you to the conclusion that people who take mass transit should not pay something to the federal government towards that because basically now those people who you say are riding or spending money on gas and diesel they're subsidizing for lack of a better word I, uh, they're subsidizing mass transit and there's no there's no there's no quid pro quo in reverse yet you're here asking for additional money which i fully understand but why shouldn't this part of the problem and the the difficulty in on this committee is exactly as you identify we're having, we, we, we need to have a conversation about how to pay this. Why shouldn't ridership be part of that when not everybody is, is uh, disadvantaged who rides mass transit all across this country? As, and increasingly, it's just the opposite. Where is Warren Buffett when you need him? Um, it's true that in, in major cities like Washington and New York and Chicago, uh, we have a much more mixed clientele in, with respect to who rides transit. Um, and certainly there are very wealthy people who ride transit every day. There are also very poor people who have no choice but to ride transit. I recently had... But poor people own cars, too. Uh, well, let me tell you a story. I was recently uh, involved in a, in a nonpartisan uh, voter turnout operation in Cleveland. And I was uh, actually on a van that picked up a voter who had to go a mile and a half from her house uphill on a terrible day to vote. And when she got on, she said, thank you. And I said, no, no, come on, we're, we're happy to take you up. No, no, thank you. She says, you know, I own a car. Yeah. I said, yeah. She says, but I can't afford the gas. Mm -hmm. now, this was in a housing project, by but the way. But isn't that a case for you to say to her, part of your gas tax is going towards this? Oh, yeah. No, uh, if and you're, you're riding mass transit, therefore you're not paying for it? I mean, well, how, well, do you, how do you justify that transfer of, of taxes? I'm just, it's a simple question. I don't need an anecdote. Okay. What I need to know is why specifically do you think people who ride mass transit have no obligation to pay what other people in this country pay through their gas tax, diesel, and excise tax. No, 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 I'm no. Not advocating they, they do anything. pay. They do pay. They pay huge fares. They pay income taxes. They pay real estate taxes that all fund transit. It's not as if transit riders are getting a free ride. But, but the more federal significantly, government the subsidizes them, but we do not. Uh, we do, the people who use the, the rest of the transportation system have historically paid directly, but that's a myth. 
That's a myth. The fact is that the subsidy per rider is much less than the subsidy per car owner in America. If you want to look at all the different subsidies that go into roads, highways, bridges, et cetera. And that's not to take away from the importance of them. But there is no payment on the part of people who use mass transit back to the federal government. That, Yet there is with gas and they, diesel and excess. Well, they pay federal taxes. That's what they do. We they all pay, pay income tax. taxes. Pardon me? We all pay federal taxes if we're in, that, in a bracket that allows okay. us to do that. Okay. But you, you, so you really don't have an answer for that question? Well, well it's, it's, I don't have a 30-second answer. There's a long, complicated answer that absolutely justifies huge increases in federal investment in transit. We'd be happy to have that discussion with you in writing or uh, personally. Uh, my time's expired. Thank you. In my brief uh, time I have left, Mr. Hanley, um, you, know, you know that I formed the Congressional Caucus on Public Transportation earlier this year. I thank you for what you have done at the local level. Uh, and um, we need to continue to do more so people understand the importance of public transportation, not to the, just to those who take that transportation, but to those who are on the roads who don't have to deal then with all the others on, on public transportation being on the roads. But uh, my time's up. so. Uh, unfortunately, I won't have an opportunity to have you uh, expand on that, so that I yield back. Thank you. I believe that states like Indiana have demonstrated that there is a role for the private sector in building and expanding our transportation infrastructure. Uh, going forward, what do you all see as effective plans for, or paths for that matter, for the private sector to help build out transportation systems? What should we consider? Uh, is there a menu of alternatives that you may have in mind? My union has had the great advantage of 122 years of vetting private companies. Um, and, we, and most of the contracts we have at this point are with private companies, not with public agencies. And we can tell you unequivocally that private companies uh, collapsed throughout the United States. It's what led to the original bill in 1964, 50 years ago, to bring mass transit back. And so long as we seek to improve transit by injecting the importance of a profit motive for private companies, we will fail. Um, government can effectively run transit. Government does effectively run transit. And frankly, trying to reinvent, you know, the 1960s when transit collapsed in America, we think is a critical mistake. to Mr. Handley is we didn't talk about a safety, transit operators' safety, whether it's railroad, bus drivers. Uh, I think we have more bus drivers, as you pointed out, um, um, suffering from fatigue and causing accidents. You have more accidents with buses than you do with airplanes. Now, how do we address those, and uh, how do we begin to understand that all of it comes together? You have to have the funding, you have to have the community support, uh, and you have to be able to have driver safety or um, employee safety, because not only is the person who's doing the driving, uh, but it's also the people he has under his charge, whether it's a bus or a train or a plane. Anybody? Congresswoman, we addressed uh, all three of those areas. One being the fact that there is a massive wave of assaults on, on transit workers, particularly bus drivers, throughout the U.S. and Canada right now. We believe it's connected to the fact that they're in a bad economy, that the service has been cut, passengers are angry, and the fares have gone up. But uh, they, these are very uh, critical assaults that are going on. People are, are being beaten within an, inch of, uh, within an inch of their life. The other thing is that in public transit, one of the dirty little secrets that nobody ever wants to talk about is that uh, transit systems do not provide bathroom breaks and do not provide access to bathrooms. And as a consequence, and this is a safety and health issue, uh, drivers all over the country are driving around developing diseases, not being able to use bathrooms, limiting their intake of water. And this is something that we, uh, we'd like to address with Congress during this uh, reauthorization. Also, in the over-the-road industry, which you just mentioned, the Greyhound-type buses, not just Greyhound, uh, because of deregulation, we have had a huge increase in safety hazards and deaths. People are dying all over the country. More people die in bus accidents now than in plane crashes, and that is because of the fact that our government has abandoned regulation. Uh, Mr. Hanley, quickly, I, at one point I, I was surprised you didn't make in responding uh, to Mr. Hanna uh, was uh, the fact that there can't we say that there is a tremendous net benefit to 
uh, highway users, particularly in urban areas, from having diverted uh, people from being in single occupancy vehicles, adding more to congestion and delaying people more. Would you, you, you want to address that briefly? Well, I couldn't have said that better. And, you know, again, <laughs> we found out uh, some of that, uh, some of the effects of congestion in Fort Wayne, New Jersey. You know, the, the fact is that that if transit riders stopped riding transit tomorrow, this country would come to a standstill. And the same impact will occur if we don't plan ahead for the next two appropriation, I'm, I'm sorry, the next two authorization periods, uh, because the population in our cities is going to explode. Eighty percent of the people in this country live in cities, and the population in many of those cities is going to grow by 30, 40, 50 percent. Um, so it, it's, uh, there's a much longer answer, obviously, to what the Congressman asked me. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that, that transit riders pay more than their fair share for their systems. Um, I want to focus on Mr. Hanley. I, following up what Mr. DeFazio and Mr. Hanna just talked about, I mean, uh, and I think the mayor said this well, that everything should be on the table. I mean, if we're going to have fund infrastructure, then everything should be on the table. And, and as you're aware, in, in MAP 21, as it passed out, a committee transit was, separate, was separated out from the gas tax. Uh, and we're not going to get into that debate today. But the point is, is that people on the committee here are struggling to find ways to do exactly what you want for your workers, because I exactly what Caterpillar wants, exactly what the mayor of Atlanta would like to have, and that's more money for infrastructure. I think we can all agree on that. So if we're going to have everything on the table, and I know, and I know you said the uh, uh, people that ride mass transit are, are paying their fair, their fair share, um, and I, I've lived in Chicago. My son goes to Emory University in your great city, and I, in fact, I just flew through your airport coming here. I, uh, I love Atlanta. Um, but that said, if everything's going to be on the table, tell me how you would think that the workers that you represent potentially would be harmed by looking at having that support on the table as a way to overall fund infrastructure, not just, not just mass transit, but as a part of a bigger equation to find more money for, for our whole intermodal system. Why would, why would your workers be against something that we might try to find uh, a way that transit could support the federal uh, highway, uh, highway and transit program? I'm, I'm just trying to get my arms around I'm not around sure I that. understand the question. Well, I mean, a gas tax is a user fee. Right. Is there a user fee, for, federal user fee for mass transit? Uh, no, but... You know, That's I, the basic question. I, I'm not saying there should be. I'm just saying if everything's on the table, what I'm trying to understand is why, why your, your workers or your industry uh, would be against having that on the table as a part of a way to help us find more money. Because we're... My, our struggle is, is, is finding more money for infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I totally agree. Last time, you know, we funded a two-year bill. It's not long enough. We used other revenue from other areas of the, of the government uh, because the, the user fees, our uh, revenue is dropping because of uh, inflation and, and no indexing of the gas tax, blah, blah, blah. We all know what the problem is. I just can't wrap my hands around the, the, on the transit side, and this is not a partisan issue because we had bipartisan people that did not right. want that separated out. Right. Why finding some money in that area is something that would hurt the workers that you represent? I just don't understand that. But you have it. I mean, I, I think if, if the goal is to say that because people who ride in cars pay gasoline taxes and some of that goes to transit, then therefore there has to be some special federal taxation on transit riders because they ride transit. I mean, I think that's what you're saying. Uh, I don't no, think I'm that's just saying, I'm just saying it seems, uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not for or against, I'm just trying to have a right. conversation here about if we're going to have everything on the table. Yeah. There are some people in Congress that think transit should not be in this highway bill, should be subject right. to annual appropriations, and I'm not saying I'm for or against that, mm -hmm. but that's what passed out of committee last time. So in our discussions, you know, how can you, you can help convince us when we need more money right. that, that we should m keep that in there, right. and, there sh and everybody else should have their taxes raised, like you, point you pointed out, like uh, the general fund, say just 
for argument's sake, the millionaires, and that's a direct quote from you. Mm, billion, pay for billionaires, though. Millionaires, billionaires, that's the talking point. And, and I, by the way, I was disappointed that you used the national talking point of the bridge uh, from New Jersey to uh, New York in part of this discussion. I think uh -huh. that was inappropriate. But the fact of the matter is, is how can you convince people that, okay, we should do that and we should use those general funds uh, to pay for transit, which, as Mr. Hanna pointed out, it's, it's – in fact, I rode in Atlanta. My son took me to, drove me to one of your uh, train stops on the north side, and I drove it, rode it directly. I love mass transit. I ride it any chance I get. I'm just trying to get my hands around how you can convince us that, that if everything's on the table, that that isn't. I think we have to walk for a minute through history um, and consider the impacts of the Eisenhower Highway Program on mass transit and on mobility in America. You know, prior to that highway program, People got around by using trolleys, trains, buses. That, that's how they, they moved around the United States of America, in our cities and between our cities. And this government made a choice uh, in the Eisenhower Highway Program to change radically the way Americans lived, to create suburbs, to drive people out of cities, or to encourage people uh, to get out of cities. It was a completely subsidized operation by this federal government to move Americans from their cities out to suburbs. And there came a point in the 60s where all of the transit systems were going broke, the ones that were not taken over by the auto industry, uh, the National City Bus Lines, which was a creation uh, that was pursued by the Justice Department for ripping up trolley systems all over the country. This is a fact. This is what happened. So then what came about is in the 1960s, uh, mob mobility in American cities was in collapse. Bus companies were going out of business, train companies going out of business, until the federal government finally had to step in. This was really the mirror image of the highway program, that where the federal government had to step in and subsidize transit to get it back up and running in order to keep our cities moving. And now what's happening is the exact opposite phenomenon of what happened in the 1950s is occurring not because of a federal government program, but because young people are saying, no, no, I don't want to live in the suburbs. I don't want to have a four-hour commute every day. I want to live where I work. Um, and there are other factors obviously involved in that. But these are societal changes, and I just don't think we can attempt rationally to isolate where federal taxes come from for a particular program. I think that's a failed strategy, and there are many reasons why, but I know I'm out of time. Okay, thank you. This conversation has just been so, uh, so fascinating. I listened earlier as well and thought from the perspective, and I want to um, ask about this, about workers, because I think about the workers um, who work for, uh, for Caterpillar and other uh, manufacturing companies who are going to be charged with building the equipment that will improve our infrastructure, the workers in communities like Atlanta and here in this region who build the roads, maintain the highways and, and uh, bridges, and maintain and operate our buses, our metros, and our, our commuter rail. And I'm no Mayor Bloomberg, but I have been known to get on our metro system and, um, and get on our buses. And of course, the workers who ride, drive, and commute. And so my question really goes to, um, uh, to Mayor Reed and uh, to Mr. Hanley asking about wages and benefits and um, things like transit benefits that go to workers so that they get off the roads and whether we're paying prevailing wages so that the jobs that we're creating actually enable people to take care of themselves and their families and build that kind of thriving economy. And I wonder if you could comment about the importance of those kind of policy initiatives as well when we consider uh, reauthorization. Uh, there are many hidden subsidies involved in, uh, in highways and cars, and, and one of the ones Congresswoman Duckworth uh, joined us in pointing out, and that is the fact that we have this need for oil, which creates a need for wars, which creates a need for American kids to lose their lives, their limbs, and their, and their heads. And uh, that's something that's never factored into this public discussion about the importance of public transit. Um, in the, the question was then about wages also? Yes, wages. Well, the fact that I, I recently had a meeting with about uh, 30 new presidents of locals in our union throughout the country and Canada, and one of them got up from Ohio and said that, that he has members who work full-time um, and work overtime and qualify for food stamps. And that gave me pause, and I said, how many presidents in this room can say the same thing? Everyone except the Canadians said that they have workers in their union working full-time qualifying for food stamps. So when we, let me just very quickly, because my time has run out, when we reauthorize 
uh, the surface transportation, do you think it's important for us to make sure that we maintain strong prevailing wage standards when it comes to spending federal dollars? It's absolutely vital. Thank you. Mr. Hanley, in your uh, testimony, you, you mentioned a GAO report, and, and in that report, you know, it, it also made uh, that same report made mentions of really the private sector working on public transit and, and the benefits. But yet in your testimony, as I've listened, I guess, to some of the question and answer, you, you don't believe that the private sector really has a strong role, I guess, going back to some of the demise from the 1964s. I, I, I don't want to misquote you, but I think that characterizes your testimony. Uh, so, so you agree in part with the GAO study, but not in totality. That well, that would be fair, uh, but are you asking a question about our views on, on the private companies in transit generally? Well, I guess my, uh, how do you pick and choose what parts of the GAO study you're going to support? You, you mentioned it in your testimony, so you pick the part that you like, and the part that you don't like, you, you kind of throw out. So what matrix do you use to qualify what's a good recommendation from the GAO and what's a bad recommendation? We don't have a matrix. Uh, we just uh, layer our thoughts and views and our knowledge on what we read in the GAO reports, and sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong. Yeah, but, but I mean, I guess, how, how do you make that determination? I mean, for me as a, as a member here, I'm trying to figure out, okay, how do I, how do I value that? So if, is, does that come from a personal bias or, or where does that come from? How do, how do, years of experience. Okay, years of experience that the private sector is not the best solution is what you're saying. Well, I know what happens. I know what happens when you inject profit into public transit. I know what happens to workers. I gave you the example of a, a, a French company run by the social security yeah, system right. taking away pensions. And the problem in, in a study like what the GAO has is it ignores that, that those facts were not uh, brought up. I'd be happy to sit down with the GAO and, uh, and they would come out with a much different study if they talked to us. Um, my constituents span the rural to the urban. I have all of that in my district, so, so I have to make that competitiveness argument, that essential need argument each and every day. And they're prepared for and want us to invest in transportation. Just last week, the mayor of my largest city in Waterbury, Connecticut, announced an initiative to put up money on the local side for a Tiger Grant for a greenway, not necessarily what you would think the most important issue is for a former manufacturing center, but they see that as vital to this integration of roads and rail and walkability to address the demographic needs of young people, and I have three of them who want to live in a city and don't want to drive cars, but they want to be in a vibrant city. So we have to do better as a society to figure out how to integrate these needs. But the same city of Waterbury is hampered by a notoriously congested uh, highway, I-84, which desperately needs to be upgraded and has corrosion and is falling apart and is affectionately known as the mix master. So you get a sense of what those highways look like. So we need to have a long-term bill. You know it. We need to convince the public and our colleagues of it. That long-term investment is going to be essential to get the sort of partnering of public-private money that clearly we're going to need to leverage to address the needs. So I'd like you to make the case as persuasively as you can as to why these investments are so essential for economic development. You know, unless in, in we turn the curve so we're looking at a growing pie and economic development, we don't get to the real core issue, which is jobs. Jobs now and jobs in the future. And so if you can expand on the critical role that transportation and the surface transportation in its myriad forms plays in that, um, that would be helpful. Well, uh, as I said earlier, uh, there is no question about the direct connection between transit. Uh, I'm leaving transportation broadly aside for a second. I just want to speak about my, my issue. I'm selfish. Sure. But the connection between transit and real estate development and real estate values is absolutely clear and undeniable. Uh, and the investment that's occurred as recently as uh, the last few years in New York has shown that when you make the investment, the real estate values go up, the tax base gets better, uh, the whole economy gets better when you do that. Um, and it's impossible, again, what, to have a short-term bill and long-term planning. There's no way we can deal with the problems your kids have unless we have plans that go out at least six years and probably longer. And obviously, all of these things end up creating a better economy and a better environment. 
and they deal with every issue Americans have to deal with today, including uh, jobs and education. Just getting kids to school is becoming harder without funding and transit.